Hello, it's part three of the robot arm project, which I've got just here so far. So we've done quite a bit of work in the last two episodes. This is gonna be a force controlled robot arm, which means that we've got these flexible sections with springs inside each of these hubs. And that means we can train the arm by driving it. It knows we're moving it. So basically it can measure the force that's applied to each joint. The motor can catch us up. Then we can store that position and we can move it from position to position. And that's how we can train it. Or if we run into something, we can tell how much force is being exerted. Or we can intentionally exert so much force that we want or measure how much force we're exerting. So quite a lot of possibilities here. So far we've built two of these hubs. We've got another piece of the arm to go on here. And then there's going to be a vertical axis that goes up and down with a gripper on. So it's going to be a bit like a scar arm. Just a quick ad for my Patreon. Don't forget you can support me on patreon.com slash xrobots and you can get access to some exclusive rewards including a live stream with me all my videos early and access to sneak peeks and pictures of upcoming projects if you don't like patreon i have youtube channel membership so just click on that join button below i also have a merchandise store hosted by teespring so that link is in the description as well and you can get open dog t-shirts mugs socks and various other designs so now it's time to design the next piece of the arm which fits on here and that looks like this so we've already designed all of this and we've also made this hub as well which we've got on the arm so now we just need the extra piece and that's eventually going to hold the vertical axis which we have the gripper on. So I've got another one of these adjustable plates to adjust the spacing between these two gears which is basically a mirror of the other axis and again I've got aluminium plates top and bottom which we're going to CNC out. This is also an aluminium plate to hold things square and we should maybe have one on here but we'll see how that goes. And the end is just 3D printed for our colour scheme and I've left holes in there to attach the vertical axis where we're going to put our gripper on. So let's get those parts cut out and printed. So there's my extra bit of the arm installed and again we've got that force driven hub so that we can force it there and we can measure the output on the shaft at the top to get the actual position reference to the encoder position then we can work out the force and we can do this on both axes so the plan will be that we can train it by bending it around and having the motor catch us up. I've put extra springs on this one which is actually back driving the motor but it won't do that once the encoder's working and we've got power on the motor. So then we can basically yank it around to train it and then have it replay the positions is the basic plan. So for now we need to get some absolute position encoders on top of these two. So you may remember from the Open Dog series I used or at least tested these AMS encoders which are absolute position magnetic encoders and they come with a little magnet that you rotate around on top of the sensor and that's how it knows what the position is and it gives you actually the degrees from 0 to 360 and these are the AS5048s this is the SPI version, you can also get an I squared C version. They've also got some extra pins on though for PWM out, which means we can read them basically with a normal pin on an Arduino. And that's what I'm gonna try and do today. 
So I'm actually using a TNC 3.6 and saying you need a normal pin. To do it accurately, you really need to use interrupts to get the timing because we're looking at microsecond timing. Every digital pin on the TNC 3.6 supports interrupts and we'll need those to read the encoders on the motors as well and at least two of these. So that seems like a good chip to use for it. So I've done a little sketch which basically sets up that as a pin change interrupt. I'm using pin zero at the moment and we've got a loop and all it does is actually writes out to the serial terminal uh, that PWM value and it's using an interrupt every time the pin is triggered this interrupt service routine runs that basically looks whether the pin's high and then if it is it starts a timer and then when it returns the value the timer gets reset again so if we go and look at the serial monitor we should be able to see those numbers there and that should be the absolute position so if I rotate this round it should count all the way down and this is just the PWM length in whole microseconds so it should go all the way to zero and then roll over again. And it seems to roll over at about a value of 930 or so. So it's not quite 10 bit, but um, that should be more than good enough um, to work out our resolution. And it's a pretty stable answer as well. We'll probably put some filtering on it, but that's not too bad. So we've got these encoder assemblies on the top. We'll have a closer look at in a minute. I just wanted to point out that the bearings, one is on top here and one is on the bottom here. And that's because this is hanging on this. So we've got this collar on top with the bearing in the top of the block to stop this slipping down. And then on here, we've got the plate pushing down on this. So the bearing is underneath and we've got the actual bearing resting on the metal. So that's why this configuration is slightly different. And these are, one is shorter and one is taller here to take account of the collar. But other than that, they're pretty much the same. So we've got the encoder there, which I'll screw down to the plate eventually. And then we've got this spacer and we've got the magnet fitted onto the shaft and that rotates with the arms. So we've got the absolute position there between this piece and the actual metal tube. So I've now wired in both the encoders and the encoders on the bottom here and all of that's wired in to my Teensy, which I've temporarily mounted here. So there's my Teensy mounted up on a bit of this Perma breadboard, which Adafruit sell, which is the same breadboard layout, but it's got solder points so you can easily build your circuit. And all of these are on little connectors on pin strips or whatever so that I can unplug the board and for the moment it's just attached with sticky tape. But essentially we've got our two encoders there for the shoulder and elbow and also the magnetic encoders off the motor. And those are all wired into digital pins, which of course on the TNC all have interrupts. So I've expanded my code out, so we're reading all of the encoders now, all four of them. So we've got the interrupt service routines that count the encoders on the actual motor encoders. So check out the last part in the series for that. And of course, we've just got two timers for the PWMs, which read the magnetic encoders, and all of those get written out to the serial terminal. So when we first power up the TNC, we're gonna get values of zero, because these are not absolute position encoders. They're basically just gonna count from when it was powered up. And the magnetic encoders are absolute position, and I've calibrated them by positioning the magnet. So roughly when the arm is straight, we get a value of around 460 on each one. So we've got the elbow and the shoulder separated out there. If I move the elbow motor, we should see both those values getting higher and obviously lower if we move it the other way. Can't quite get that back to zero. Of course, this will be driven quite accurately, but if I jam the motor and move the flexible section, we should see only the first value moving from the absolute position encoder. So once that's calibrated, we can then work out what the relative difference is and how much force is being applied and we get the same effect um, on the other axis over here. So what we could do on startup is drive those motors to get to a value where this is straight and it's known, zero out the non-absolute position encoders so that they're both calibrated and then we can go from there with our kinematic model or whatever else we do. So moving a step further on, basically I've now got a scaled value and I've just scaled down the motor encoder that has that really high encoder count. So it's roughly the same sort of order as the magnetic encoder. In fact, it's pretty precise actually. And now we're calculating the force. So the force is the difference between the top encoder, the absolute position, and the um, scaled version of the motor encoder. So now if we look in a serial monitor, we've got some extra numbers and the force is this far right column here. The other one is my scaled value. So now if we manipulate the arm, we should see of course that if we just move one axis, then basically that force, there is a little bit of a uh, backlash in here that I still need to account for for multiple reasons I mentioned last time. But that force should stay around zero wherever we put it or some number there, until I actually grab that axis, let's just block that gear and move it and we can see it goes positive in one direction and negative in the other. And it does that wherever we are, of course, because basically we're actually matching these two, we're matching the encoder and the encoder here with that scaling function. So we should get a force of around zero and we probably need to filter that 
until we actually apply force and that gives us a force value. And we can do several things with that, including driving the motor. So as we actually push this, the motor will actively turn and we can leave it in a position. Or of course we can just measure the force if the robot collides with something. So I've now fitted two motor drivers and these are the IBT4 drivers that you can commonly get. And they do, I think 15 volts and 20 amps or something. And that's fine for my 12 volt motors. So I've now set up the motors so they're driven by their encoders and a PID controller, the same as we did last time. So now I can type in values here. So if we uh, set the first motor to an encoder position of 5,000, that will do that for both of them. And we should be to see those motors moving. And if we set them back to zero, then yep, the arms should move all the way back. And the numbers we've got here basically are the two encoder values. And then we've got the force for each one of those. And we've also got the motor output, which is what the M is. So each of those arms. So we should find now that the encoders are basically um, using those PID controllers to lock the motor in place. So we can't back drive the motor, but we can obviously back drive the springs. So now I can move this all round. And as I do so, you should see those force values go up as I'm actually stretching the springs. And obviously in one direction is positive and one direction is negative. So you'll notice there's quite a lot of wobble in the arm, particularly owing to this hub due to the spring stretching. So we need to tighten those springs up or put stiffer springs in, but I'm not gonna do that until we've got the other axis on the arm and we've got all the mass in there, because otherwise it's gonna be really hard to tune. But now we've got that force reading, the difference between the encoder positions on each of these hubs, we can use that for something quite useful. So what I've now done with that force value is made a force offset, which is accumulative basically. So every time the cycle goes round if the force which I've thresholded here to being more than five or less than minus five is outside that range essentially it gets added to this offset on every cycle and it does that for both of the axis so this value will get bigger and bigger and bigger the more force there is every time the code loop goes round then I've just added that to the set point so that's the set point for the PID controller that's trying to position the motors and now we can see what the effect is that means when I apply force to either of the hubs it actually adds that to the demand position for this motor and its encoder. So if I now actually skew this hub, we can, should see the uh, motor actually rotating round. And the more force I apply, the faster it goes. And obviously when I actually move the arm, it'll do that as well because I'm applying force to that hub and it'll comply with me updating that demand encoder position, the actual position for the joints. And obviously when I'm not applying force, it doesn't modify that position anymore, so it stays there. So now basically I can make this compliant and I can push it around and you should be able to see those PWM values actually updating for that motor. So it's not just back driving the motor, the motor is actively moving, of course we can see there, in response to that hub having force applied to it. And I've done that to both of them. So now if I push this, we can make the whole arm go and comply and it stays where I put it, updating both of those demands positions. So that's actually quite useful because that means we can train the arm. We can say, well, actually, I want you to go to this position. We could save that position. And then we could play it back later, either using the absolute position encoders or the motor encoder position, whichever one of those we thought was more accurate. So that's actually quite useful. And that's going to be one of the modes and one of the clever things that we can do with this arm due to its force controlled hubs. So one of the other things we can do, of course, is drive by force instead of by position. And so giving a positive force to one of those joints will make it sweep round until it hits something. The springs would stretch by a certain amount, however much force we said, and then it would stop. So that means we could push something with a certain amount of force or measure a certain amount of force. We can also, of course, just drive the arm by position once we've trained it and use it like a normal robot arm. So I do need to sort out those mechanical um, issues, including those springs and the slight mechanical gap in there. And I'm not gonna do that till next time when I'm gonna build the next axis, which is the gripper that's gonna slide up and down. And that axis is gonna be force controlled as well as the actual gripper as well. And I built a prototype that I brought out several weeks ago. So don't forget to check that out. But that's all for now. So don't forget to subscribe if you like the video for more in the series and like the video if you liked it. All right, that's all for now.